Let's talk about the scaling monosemanticity paper in May 2024. Okay, so what did it take to scale this to apply to Claude 3 Sonnet? Well, a lot of GPUs. <laughs> a lot more GPUs. Um, but one of my teammates, Tom Hennigan, um, was involved in the original scaling loss work. Um, and something that he was sort of interested in from very early on is, are there scaling laws for interoperability? Um, and so um, something he sort of immediately did when when this this work started to succeed and we started to have sparse autoencoders work was he became very interested in, you know, what are the scaling laws for, um, uh, you know, for making, making sparse autoencoders larger and how does that relate to making the base model larger? Um, and so um, it turns out this works really well and you can use it to sort of project, um, you know, if you train a sparse autoencoder at a given size, you know, how many tokens should you train on and so on. So this was actually a very big help to us in scaling up um, this work um, and made it a lot easier for us to go and train, um, you know, really large sparse autoencoders where, you know, um, it's not like training the big models, but it's, it's starting to get to a point where it's actually actually expensive to go um, and train the really big ones. So you have to, I mean, you have to do all the stuff of like splitting it across large oh yeah no i mean there's a huge engineering challenge here too right so yeah so so there's there's this there's a scientific question of how do you scale things effectively um and then there's an enormous amount of engineering to go and scale this up so you have to you have to shard it you have to you have to think very carefully about a lot of things i'm lucky to work with a bunch of great engineers because i am definitely not a great engineer. yeah and the infrastructure especially yeah for sure so it turns out tldr it worked it worked yeah <laughs> and, and i think this is important because you could have imagined you could have, like you could have imagined a world where you set after towards monosemanticity. You know, Chris, this is great. You know, it works on a one-layer model, but one-layer models are really idiosyncratic. Um, like, you know, maybe maybe that's just something idios like maybe the linear representation hypothesis and superposition hypothesis is the right way to understand a one-layer model, but it's not the right way to understand larger models. Um, and so I think, um, I mean, first of all, the, the Cunningham et al. paper sort of um, cut through that a little bit and, and sort of suggested that, that this wasn't the case. But um, scaling on a semanticity sort of, I think, was significant evidence that even for very large models, and we did it on Claude 3 Sonnet, which at, at that point was uh, one of our production models, um, you know, even these models um, seem to be very, you know, seem to be substantially explained at least by linear features and you know doing dictionary running on them works and as you learn more features you go and you explain explain more and more so that's a i think a quite a promising sign and you find now really fascinating abstract features um and the features are also multimodal they respond to images and text for the same concept which is fun yeah this can you explain that i mean like you know back door there's just a lot of examples that you can yeah, so maybe maybe let's start with a, uh, one example to start, which is we found some features around sort of security vulnerabilities and backdoors and code. So it turns out those are actually two different features. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a security vulnerability feature. And if you force it active, Claude will start to go and write um, security vulnerabilities like buffer overflows into code. And it also it fires for all kinds of things. Like, it, you know, some of, the, some of the top data set examples for it were things like, you know, dash dash disable um you know ssl or something like this which are sort of obviously really um uh really insecure so at this point it's kind of like and maybe it's just because the examples are presented that way it's kind of like surface a little bit more obvious examples right um i guess the the idea is that down the line it might be able to detect more nuanced like deception or bugs or that kind of stuff yeah well i maybe i want to distinguish two things so um one is um, the complexity of the feature or the concept, right? And the other is the m the nuance of the how subtle the examples we're looking at, mm -hmm. right? So when we when we show the top data set examples, those are the most extreme examples that cause uh, that feature to yeah. to activate. Um, and so it doesn't mean that it doesn't fire for more subtle things. So the uns you know the the insecure um, code feature, you know, the stuff that it fires for most strongly for are these like really obvious, you know disable the security type things. Um, but, um, um, you know, uh, it, it also fires for, you know, buffer overflows and, and more subtle security vulnerabilities in code. You know, but these features are all multimodal. So you could ask like, what images activate this feature? And it turns out um, that the, uh, the, the security vulnerability feature activates for images of um, uh, like people are clicking on Chrome to like go past the like, you know, this this website, uh, the SSL certificate might mm -hmm. be wrong or something like this. Another thing that's very entertaining is there's backdoors and code feature. Like you activate it, it goes and Claude writes a backdoor that like will go and dump your data to a port or something. But you can ask, okay, what what images activate the backdoor feature? It was devices with hidden cameras in them. 
So there's a whole, uh, apparently, genre of people going and selling devices that look innocuous, that have <laughs> hidden cameras, and they have ads that have this a hidden camera in it. And I guess that is the, you know, physical version of a backdoor. Um, and so it sort of shows you how abstract these concepts are, right? Um, and I, I just thought that was, uh, I mean, I'm sort of sad that there's a whole market of people selling devices like that. But I was kind of delighted that that was the, the thing that it came up with as the, the top uh, image examples for the feature. Yeah, it's nice. It's multimodal. It's multi almost context. It's, it's it's broad, strong definition of a singular concept. It's nice. Yeah. To me, one of the really interesting features, especially for AI safety, is deception and lying, and the possibility that these kinds of methods could detect uh, lying in a model, especially get smarter and smarter and smarter. Presumably, that's a big threat of a super intelligent model that it can deceive the people operating it. Uh, as to its intentions or any of that kind of stuff. So what what have you learned from detecting lying inside models? Yeah, so I think we're in some ways in early days for that. We find quite a few features related to deception and lying. There's one feature where it fires for people lying and being deceptive and you force it active and Claude starts lying to you. So we have a have a deception feature. I mean, there's all kinds of other features about withholding information and not answering questions, features about power seeking and coups and stuff like that. So there's, there's a lot of features that are kind of related to spooky things. And if you um, force them active, Claude will, will behave in ways that are they're not the kinds of behaviors you want. 